Hello folks, here is Maximus with another reading from my own writing so that you can hear the writer speak to you and you can actually recognize that there is a person who is writing this, who is saying this and um, yeah, it is important for you to experience the embodied language that I am talking about in this writing. And I know that I go on a tangent sometimes, uh, but you just got to acknowledge that my way of pointing things out is so elaborate because we're dealing with a gigantically important issue. So here is a letter which I wrote to all the people from Western capitalistic democratic societies. Yeah, all these people who live in these Western capitalistic democratic societies have a certain amount of individual freedom, individual freedom which does not exist in any other country anywhere else in the world. And yet, these, yeah, you could say, um, we, we, the, we, people have become so used to having these freedoms in Europe, in America, in Canada, in, yeah, in uh, Scandinavia. And yet, we do not really protect these freedoms. And there's a reason why we are not protecting these freedoms. We do not have the language that is needed to protect these freedoms. And I call that the language of individualism, which we urgently need to acquire. So I'll start my reading here. Unfortunately, you have, due to your unintelligent, unconscious and coercive disembodied language, still not been able to connect the dots. And consequently, you have never fully acknowledged that individualism, the modern foundation of your culture, requires an urgent change in the way that you talk so that you can begin to engage in and enjoy embodied language, which is the one and only true capital of the happy and free individualistic way of life. So I am identifying in this writing from also a historical perspective, the importance of the capital of individualistic societies. That capital can only linguistically be captured by the language of individualism, which Western societies have yet to acquire. We have not yet identified what I call embodied language. We are predominantly engaging in disembodied language. And disembodied language, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we are aware of it or not, whether we want to know about it or not, disembodied language is the language of the group. And it doesn't matter which group we are talking about, this ethnicity, that ethnicity, this religion, that religion, this political party, that political party, it doesn't matter. It, it is the language of the group. It is the language which basically diminishes the individual, the language of the individual. And the language of the individual is a completely different language than the language of the group. We in Western societies have given rights to individuals, and yet 
we have yet to acknowledge the importance of this new way of talking, which will set the stage for a whole new way of dealing with language. A whole new way of dealing with language, which of course would then change our perception, change our beliefs, especially our false beliefs, our superstitious beliefs. Let me continue. So I happen to be a Dutch guy who has immigrated to the United States. I never asked to be born in the Netherlands. I happen to be born in the Netherlands. The only thing I could come up with when I was a teenager in terms of what do I want in my life was to travel, to get out of Holland, to discover other cultures, to go to other countries, to live there, to feel what it was like, to experience their culture. And I went to many different countries. But I did not know what I wanted for myself for a long time. But the point I'm trying to make is that I am now, I have immigrated to the United States in 1999. I got married with an American woman. I have a wonderful marriage with my wife, Bonnie. And I feel like, yeah, I chose to be an American. And I feel very, very strongly about why I'm here in the United States, why I am this new citizen here in the United States. Because America, to me, in spite of all its flaws, is still the beacon of individualism, is still at the forefront of, yeah, you could say, advocating for the individual, even though we have not yet, as I have said, acquired the language of individualism. So in explaining to you that I am from the Netherlands and that I am a proud American, I'm letting you know that I'm aligning myself with the history of the Dutch people who came to the United States. There were Dutch people that came to the United States, pilgrims or, you know, founding fathers, whatever you call them. They created their colony and they made their way here in the United States. And they had a big influence actually on how America became what it is. Yeah. And so I want to also align myself with the Dutch part of, yeah, who, who came here in, in, back in the days. And who then were, because the Dutch colony that was created in New York, which later became New Amsterdam, uh, was overrun by the British. But that influence of the Dutch has always been here. And it is very undervalued in uh, most American uh, history books. Okay, Amsterdam is the capital of the Netherlands, as it is the center of commercial activities. When the Dutch settlers came to the United States and created their, uh, it was not the America, it was just, you know, it was still not the United States. It was, of course, it, it was the Americas back in the days so, because they, they, um, they called these people Indians. I don't know, I've heard this, but maybe I'm wrong. They called these people Indians because they believed that they were in India, but that was wrong. In any case, so many things were wrong back in the days because they just did not know or they were just forcing their own truth on the reality, as is so often the case and is, as still is the case. When the Dutch settlers came to their, created their colony, it was called New Amsterdam, which later then became New York. It was the Dutch individualistic mentality to basically not bother about anyone's belief but to trade with anyone who had something to trade as long as the transaction was profitable. So the Dutch were kind of philosophically more liberated than any other culture at that point of time, 1600 uh, something. Yeah. The Dutch, they really were. And that was all based on, you know, back in the days, there was, of course, uh, 
Erasmus and there was Spinoza and there was Descartes and they were all in Holland at that time. And so these British pilgrims, um, we do not know much about those, but these British pilgrims, they came to Holland actually first and they lived for almost more than a decade in the Netherlands, but I'll get to that in a, point, in a moment. So my point again is that the capital, yeah, the true value of America, of individualism, was actually based on this trade, yeah? And, and as religions don't matter, there's religious freedom, yeah? Religions don't matter as long as we can have exchanges, as long as we can trade. And the Dutch were very good at that in those days. So later, this foundational principle was enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, which said, we hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we can all agree, and we should agree, as modern people, that this statement from the Declaration of Independence, which is obviously the best that anyone could do with their superstitious disembodied language, because that is, of course, yeah, a product of a certain way of dealing with language at the time, which hasn't changed, yeah, which still continues to this very day, so this statement, it tells us that it was not the individual, but it was God. Yeah? God is the capital of the land of the free. Well, any rational human being would say, uh-uh, it wasn't God. Yeah, uh, we were believing all that kind of stuff. I understand. It was not God. It was man himself who decided we are going to live by our own rules. Yeah, the founding fathers, that was a group of 18th century revolutionary American leaders who united the 13 colonies. Yeah, because there were many different colonies back then. And then they oversaw the war against the, for, for independence from Britain, yeah. Uh, and they were the ones who actually established the United States and they crafted the framework of government for the new nation, yeah. So it's a very important point, yeah. It's easy to overlook and it's easy to also disparage this importance of the individuals who actually created this, but it is excruciatingly important in this day and age because we're still trapped by all kind of religious superstition, which is demonized as if there's something evil about it. No, there is not anything evil about it because individualism is inherently stepping away from any group behavior, which means also religion. So it wasn't some god, but it was a group of rugged individuals who rebelled and who moved away from the so-called rule by divine right. Yeah, because these kings, King George III, they ruled by divine right. They were supposedly descendants of God. That was outdated according to these new people who came to the United States. And that's why they drafted and signed this important, fantastic document, the Declaration of Independence. This part of history is so important. And it takes a Dutch or a formerly Dutch person who is now a proud American to point this out to you. So the, there's few people who know that the pilgrims who had first escaped from England, they actually, because they were persecuted in England, they first found a sanctuary before the Mayflower took off, the, the ship that sailed them to the United States. Yeah, before they came in that ship to the United States, they lived for more than a decade 
in the Dutch city of Leiden, where they were free to worship and where they enjoyed much peace and liberty. <laughs> Some even said they were doing so well in the Netherlands that there wasn't even any reason anymore to go to America as they already had found religious freedom in the Netherlands, in Holland. The only real reason that these pious people eventually faced the unknown and left their pleasant environment and sailed across the Atlantic Ocean was, of course, economical. Remember that word, economical, commercial. So these pilgrims, interestingly, they made their way to the United States or to America, sorry, where, like many other people nowadays, they were economic migrants. They had worked in Leiden's flourishing textile industry, but as former farmers, they had very little else to survive on than their skills, which they adopted from living there, of weaving and spinning and making cloth. And so they were making it in the Netherlands. They were not doing terribly bad, but the industry, the textile industry, the wool industry collapsed due to international uh, trade. And then all of a sudden their capital was gone. All of a sudden they had nothing to survive on. Change in economy. Yeah. So, so my point is here, they didn't have any capital anymore. I'm just keeping that word out there, capital, because that word means a lot to me. It is really fascinating to know that these highly moral people, these fanatical religious English pilgrims, they on the one hand appreciated the Dutch religious freedoms, which they, but on the other hand, they rejected these same freedoms because they felt it spoiled their children. It, 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 it sort of endangered them because they were, yeah, all of a sudden aware of all kinds of things which were allowed in Holland. And Holland in those days was really Amsterdam, yeah, as, as the hub of commercial trade, was really like the most important, the most affluent, the most liberated place in whole of Europe. And everybody came to Amsterdam back in those days, yeah? And that's why Amsterdam also was also called New Amsterdam when, when the pilgrims came to what, what later became New York. So these, it, it's kind of double, you know, like on the one hand, they love these Dutch freedoms, they came there. And on the other hand, they also were against it. It was, however, their notion of greater economic prosperity in America, mixed with their new sense of individual freedom, which they had inadvertently picked up from the Dutch culture, which became their new capital once they arrived in the new world. The pilgrims saw, of course, more opportunity also to preach their Christian religion in America to the Native Americans. And... <laughs> The corporations that were surfing the goals of the investors, yeah, these investors, they were seeking to find profit in these pilgrims. They were more down to earth. And so these investors, they were more interested in profits, yeah, economical profits, gain from their investments than in profits. Profits meaning like, you know, these religious people with their religious mumbo jumbo. It's interesting because that's a more of a pragmatic approach. And of course, they had to survive in the United States. And the only way to survive was to do trade. And so um, when, when eventually these pilgrims, these British pilgrims left with a ship with the Mayflower to, to the United States, there were also a whole bunch of non-believers aboard from these ships, adventurers, 
uh, you know, desperados perhaps, or all kinds of people who wanted to seek out new freedom in this new country. And so, and these people were also going to ascertain to the investors that the voyage was going to be made more profitable so that they would get a return on their investment. And so this Mayflower uh, sailing boat, yeah, it landed actually much more north than uh, it was intended. And so because they were all of a sudden on their own, much more north, separated from the um, Virginia Company Charter, they had to sort of carve out their own, yeah, uh, their own colony there in the north. And because of that, uh, yeah, they, they, they had to sort of figure it out on their own, but they also became more independent in spite of all their problems. So the pilgrims, by and large, they gave the investors very little or no return on their investments. And they were only able to find some sense of stability, finally, because, you know, with their religion, of course, they could not make any money. They only found some stability, finally, when they got into the trade of hides, beaver hides, uh, when, when they were finally bringing in some money. Yeah. And uh, in spite of the fact that they could sustain themselves, uh, very little of that ever uh, went back to the, br the British investors. <laughs> and so um, it's, it's just interesting, you know, because uh, ships also sank and uh, 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 I don't know, of course, they, they already were independent there far away. And so that is how eventually also this whole idea of independence from King George began to yeah, emerge in these colonies. So as you can understand from this brief historical overview of America, which is of just, just in a nutshell, a couple of uh, yeah, cherry-picked uh, aspects of it, um, it always was, and it still is, capitalism which paves the way for individualism. And although individualism has, of course, been also uh, bamboozled, I would say, by religion in America, yeah, because that goes on to this very day, um, where we still have this sort of hangover from religion, uh, where uh, all these religious people demand all kinds of things which actually have nothing to do with modern life. And so um, I am in favor of the individual, but the individual rights and the individual way of life, historically as well as currently, is made possible by the fact of economic prosperity. That's the point I'm making. The capital is individualism and individualism requires capitalism. There is no capitalism without individualism. The two go hand in hand. They are two sides of the same coin, I should say. So with our embodied language, we will truly make individualism the capital of our culture in Western democratic capitalistic societies. But with this embodied language, we continue to maintain at all costs, similarly to these puritanical pilgrims, our outdated, unrealistic, anti-commercial and ultimately non-productive beliefs. Yeah. By the way, capital reminds me of Das Kapital, yeah, the famous critique of the political con econ economy by Karl Marx, which is actually the Bible of communists who are vehemently against individualism. So my opinion and my reason for making this video is that it is not the economic structure or as Karl Marx says, the forces and relations of productions, which are the crucial factors in shaping a society, 
but the freedom of the individual. The only real capital we have, whether it is economical or psychological, is individual freedom. Yeah. And so individual freedom requires embodied language. Disembodied language is the stand in the way to individual freedom. And we have yet to acknowledge the difference between embodied language and disembodied language. More to come later on.